So I'm going to talk about the fact that migration, I think, generally has the potential to be a force for good with many benefits, but that it's important uh, that we note that there is a two-tier system in operation, both in terms of how we conceptualise it and how we experience it, and ignoring that is not helping us. It's also not helping us if we ignore the gulf of understanding and experience um, because that has already had a consequence in the referendum result but will have a consequence for the future. I'm also going to say that the solutions to this gulf lies in more in tackling underlying inequalities, economic inequalities but also social inequalities that are both intra and international and that if we don't close that gap and focus instead on lecturing people with whom we do not agree that they are wrong and we are right, we will not get very far and here we are not getting very far um, and I'm also going to talk about the fact that we haven't had the sort of national debate that I'm going to try and do a mini version of today uh, with one exception which I'll, again I'll talk a bit about so first of all who moves well probably everyone in this room maybe I don't know I, I won't make you put up your hands but I think a lot of people in this room may have had some positive experiences of, of migration perhaps for work purposes perhaps for studying purposes or perhaps you still intend to but probably most of us were not forced and probably we had relatively few difficulties in then returning when we wanted to or moving on. But war, climate change and extreme poverty forced many other millions of people to migrate each year with much less choice. We then have family members trying to join relatives and people who are not the world's poorest but nevertheless want to move to a different country because they believe they can achieve a better life for their families by taking another job in that family and sending home their salary in the form of remittances and I'm going to talk a bit about that. I'm going to give you a few figures, I've tried to keep them to a few. About First of all about international migration as a whole and these are figures correct up to the end of 2017. And that showed that since the year 2000, international migration as a whole had been growing at between 2 and 3% each year since the turn of the millennium, reaching 258 million migrants in 2017. 258 million. That's up from 173 million in the year 2000. Most of these people are in high-income countries. High-income countries host almost two-thirds of in all international migrants. And about a third, 92 million, are in middle or low income countries, and of those, most are in the middle income countries. And also, most of the world's migrants as a whole live in a relatively small number of countries, and in 2017, more than half were living in just 10 countries. The largest number were residing in the United States of America, 50 million. That's 19%, with Saudi Arabia, Germany, and the Russian Federation holding the second, third, and fourth largest number of migrants worldwide. And I was surprised, actually, by the, that, some of that. Um, followed by the United Kingdom, with nearly 9 million, and the United Arab Emirates, with 8 million. And of the 20 largest countries of destination of international migrants worldwide, nine are in Asia, seven are in Europe, two are in Northern America, and one each in Africana and Oceania. And then thinking about the country of origin of those international migrants, 106 million were born in Asia, 61 million were born in Europe, the second largest region of origin. So Europe is part of the source of international migration and the destination. Um, relatively few migrants are born in North America, only 4 million, or Oceania. So relative to their share of the world's population, migrants from Europe, Latin America, Caribbean and Oceania are overrepresented, while international migrants from Asia, North America and Africa are underrepresented. Forced migration, however, is a different picture. So forced migration, people who did not choose to move but felt forced, usually by war, sometimes by climate change or extreme poverty, by the end of 2016, there were around 68.5 million people who were forcibly displaced. That's about a quarter of all international migrants. So that may be the opposite way around from a lot of the popular discourse. Most international migrants are voluntary. Most are, effectively, economic migrants. Though the governor of the Bank of England doesn't tend to get called an economic migrant, an economic migrant he is nonetheless. The developing regions hosted 82.5% of the world's refugees and asylum seekers. So there's another myth, I think, I hope, scotched. Most refugees and asylum seekers only go to the first country they get to, for all sorts of perfectly obvious reasons, once you think about it. But that also means that countries such as Jordan, the Palestinian territories, Lebanon Pakistan, and Pakistan, and Uganda, Uganda, are the host countries for most refugees. And I think if we want to take a different approach to um, immigration, we need to think about 
what the, uh, the last president of the United States, President Obama, started in the Global Compacts on Migration and Refugees, which aimed, not far succeeded, to share out the responsibility for migration and for refugees more equitably around the world. Because at the moment, we basically leave it to the neighboring countries, the frontline states. Millions of people were displaced during the, for each of the last few years, fleeing war and violence and so on, as well as from uh, Syria, uh, which is one of the largest countries of origin of refugees. Uh, that's Syria, there were 5 million, Afghanistan, 2.6 million, and South Sudan, 2.4 million. Those are the top three sources of refugees. But refugees also come from the Central African Republic, the DRC, Iraq, and Myanmar. And at the same time, other protracted crises remain entrenched. So the war in Afghanistan actually technically was over some time ago, but refugees are still arriving. And two million of them are still hosted in the Islamic republics of Iran and Pakistan, hundreds of thousands more across the world. So people move. Mostly they're not forced. Is that a good thing? For the sharing of ideas, of skills, of experiences, the broadening of minds, you could say yes. For the providing of sanctuary, you would say yes, although that's not quite the same thing, because most of those people probably didn't want to move before they were forced to. But what about social cohesion? What about a sense of identity? What about climate change? What about family life? And it's less clear when we consider all of those things that migration is just simply a good thing, which many of us would have started out with. Um, I haven't mentioned, for instance, internally displaced people. People often think about refugees, but actually half of the people displaced by the war in Syria are still stuck in Syria, about five million. And they're stuck for all sorts of reasons, but partly to do with border controls on the, uh, the southernmost states above them, so the northern states above them. So what about migration from the EU and the impact of the apparently impending departure from the EU? And here I want to draw attention to another two-tier aspect, which is that almost from day one, and it was literally, I think, about a week later, after the referendum, I, as an MP, was lobbied by a very well-organised, very articulate group of EU27 citizens. They were mostly the academics, the doctors, the environmental consultants, professional people with a very high sense of their entitlement, their, their correct entitlement to be there, but also an expectation that they would lobby me and I would be able to deliver what they wanted, or at least that I would support it, which, of course, I did. But this is a contra in contrast with virtually zero lobbying by those EU 27, uh, con EU 27 citizens from the new member states, from Eastern Europe. Anecdotally, people are telling me that those who work in the care sector or other margins of employment and who've come from the new member states, have, they've not just not lobbied me, they've gone home, quietly, without any fuss. That doesn't mean they were happy about it, it means they had no expectation that lobbying me would produce any results whatsoever. Whereas the university lecturers and so on have either stayed and continued to lobby me and fight, or they have taken equivalent jobs elsewhere in the EU. So this is another two-tier. A uh, two-tier of people who have some agency and choice and people who have less agency and choice. Some of us who love free movement and voted to keep it and have loudly campaigned to keep it, and we say it's a good thing, but what if we were to extend that good thing? What if we were to, ex to ex rather than restrict it or end it, what would it look like if it went worldwide? What would a globally open border system actually look like? And there may be some of you in the room who believe that that's the way we should go. We should have completely open borders. Well, if we did, I would say we would still have a two-tier system. It certainly would make it a lot easier for people like me to move where I fancied moving. Um, it would mean less admin, but probably to places that I would probably have gone to eventually anyway. Um, and that I would continue to treat the world as the place that I believed it to be, a place that was open to me. But there would still be forced migration. There would still be people forced to move because of conflict and poverty and climate change. And they would still be making dangerous journeys. The inequalities would still exist. And people who had economic means would find it easier to get out of war and conflict, relatively speaking, than those who had less. What difference would it make, open borders make? And I think for the millions who remain displaced within their own country, such as the Syrian internally displaced persons, their lives would possibly be easier because they'd be able to get through the Turkish border more easily. However, they may still be trapped by the nature of conflict. So it's not a simple solution, just saying, let's get rid of all the rules. As people moved, we'd still have forms, we'd still have processes, we'd still have registration and deregistration and taxation, and we'd still have rent agreements to sign. So there would never be, in my view, 
a, a system with no sort of administration behind it. And therefore, if there's administration, there would be rules. And if there were rules, there could still be people who were out with those rules. And therefore, people who would be eventually either asked to leave or sent home. For more debates, talks and interviews, subscribe today to the Institute of Art and Ideas at IAI TV.